Six years. A lot can happen in six years. Um, this group of kids that's graduating, it is, um, we started in sixth grade, coming into sixth grade, and now um, we're getting ready to send them off. And um, it was it was really neat to, to get uh, some of the old pictures together from the video, for the video and going way back. And I'm sure many of the kids are like, why did you put that picture, Trevor? But... Um, what an honor and a privilege it is to uh, have had the opportunity to pour into these seniors um, and their families. Today, uh, today reminds me a lot like uh, family gatherings that, that, that we had um, growing up. Every summer we would, we would go over to my grandmother's house, normally around the 4th of July, and we would, um, we would get together and there'd be kids playing cash in the backyard. I remember my grandmother had this cool swing in the backyard that we'd always go and sit in and Parents sit up, you know, on the deck and watch all of us young ones run around. And, you know, now that I'm not so young anymore, we watch our kids um, do the same thing. Parents would sit on the deck or sit inside in the, in the family room and talk about things like politics and the family and um, work and, you know, kind of the weightier adult-themed topics. And, but, then, but then would come the best part of any family gathering um, at Grandma's house, the food. We would gather together. Grandma would be slaving away at some sort of roast or potatoes or some sort of salad. She did a lot of the, you know, little salads with all the little chunky things in them, like little yogurt salads or whatever, jello salads, um, little strawberries, you know the one that's kind of got chunky. Th- anyways, the food. And when we would sit down, I don't know how it is, it's your guys' family, but, but at ours there was always like the, the adult table, and then you had the kid table. And two different tables, part of the same meal. Um, and the experience at each table was, was radically different. You know, you had the adult table with kind of the nice tablecloth, and Grandma would always get out um, kind of the, the fancier silverware. You know, you had, you had you know, well, real silverware instead of, like, plastic stuff. Um, you know, they had the centerpiece with kind of the floral arrangement in the middle, bigger portions at the adult table, right? So when you moved up to the adult table, you knew you, you would get a little bit more to worry about as far as eating. Um, the, the adult conversations would, would be a little bit mature, you know, in nature, but they'd talk a lot about history and, and how the family came together and grew. And um, the adult table was, was unique. But then at the flip side, you got the kids' table. Little different experience, same food, same house, same family, but a little bit different. You got sippy cups, plastic plates and silverware. You have... Um, Different conversations. Kids' table has normally got a little bit of laughter, probably some crying, maybe some yelling at each other, some goofiness and some silliness, maybe some crying, maybe some fighting. And so, again, one meal, two tables, two very different experiences. And it, it makes sense, right? Because, you know, you put the kids in the, in, the, in, in the kitchen with the linoleum floor instead of being in the fancy room with the carpet, which I don't know why you'd put carpet in any family room, just put in a, like d- dining room because... Even with parents, we still drop food, but that's for another day. It's convenient to have the two tables, but it creates creates a gap, a gap in the family, because the two tables are separate, and each table is missing out on the experience at the other table, the experiences that help a family grow together. And the adult table... Without the kids and the teenagers, misses out on some of that fun and excitement and energy and maybe some of the crying that happens with the children. And at the children's table, they miss out on the stories, the stories of the past, the stories of how grandma and grandpa met. They miss out on on the stories of how mom and dad probably made some of the same mistakes that the kids get in trouble for today. They miss out on the shared identity and sense of belonging that comes from being a part of a family. And too often, the church, the family of God, we have the same problem. And we suffer because of it. It's easy to look at the church and see how we have two and sometimes three tables set up. We have a kid's table. We have the adult table. And I guess you could say you also have the the youth table, right? Back in the day, uh, youth ministry used to be called the one-eared Mickey Mouse. You had the main congregation, and you had the, uh, the, the kids programming. And a lot of times now, 
you have the congregation, you have the kids and the youth, and you're looking like you, you got a Mickey Mouse church. Three things happening and taking place at the same time, but by dividing them out, we're missing the joy of being and doing life together. Uh, when I grew up, I remember even, even in the Presbyterian church, you would have the big service, and then the kids would be quickly shuffled away to go to Sunday school after, you know, after the first song. And we, we, were missing, we were missing out. Our place was not in the big service. Our place was at the kids' table at church. And, and everybody misses out when we do that. But at some point, we become teenagers, and we go from the kids' table, and we're in that in-between. You know, at what point do I go from being a kid... At the kid table, do I move up to being an adult at an adult table? We ask ourselves, what, what's our place? At which table do I belong? And, and this is where I believe the two slash three table setup is, is hurting us. Because along the way, people, young adults, children, they lose their place at the table because they don't know where they're supposed to be. What's my place? At what table do I belong? And along the way, we'll see that if we don't have a place at the table, are we going to come to the table? And so we're going to start off in uh, Acts chapter 2. So I'm going to let you go and get out your Bibles. Let me hear the Find it. Acts chapter 2. We're going to be in verses uh, 42 through 47 to start. I'm going to let you find it. Fun thing of note. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, we'd invite you to either take one of our pew Bibles, or even better, if you want something a little bit more robust, come, come talk to us. We'd love to, we'd love to, to take care of you. I'm, I'm, I'm slightly biased to the print Bible um, because you can do cool things like, you know, I've had this Bible 10 years, and you can get in there, and you can mark it up and color and highlight and circle and put dates in there, and, and then you get in here and, you know... You beat it up, and then you super glue it, and duct tape it, and do all sorts of things. Um, but when you read God's Word, and then you go back and see how God talked to you with these different things, um, it's really cool. And so I'd encourage you, um, day one of a brand new Bible is kind of boring, and it's just this plain, but as you hear God speaking to you through your time studying it, it's, it's cool. And so um, get a copy, a print copy of God's Word. That's my challenge. Not part of the message, you got that for free. It's not gonna cost you anything extra, except for a few more minutes of your time. Acts chapter two, um, we have this beautiful picture of, of the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God coming down and resting on the disciples, the followers of Jesus. And, and things you know, go crazy, right? People start speaking in different languages. The Jews who'd gathered together because of Pentecost were able to hear and understand the disciples who, who were some of the disciples who were Gentiles teaching them in their own language. People from all over the world were hearing and understanding the power of God for the first time. Peter gets up there and preaches this epic sermon, and, and 3,000 people um, come to know the Lord, hearing how Jesus had fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures, how he was and is the resurrected king and Lord. And very quickly, the church starts to grow. The Holy Spirit empowers them to be messengers of Jesus, and a new community starts to take shape, right there, the church as we know it. I'm going to read it because I want you to hear it. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. Again, my version might be a little different than yours, and that's okay. It all says the same thing, I promise. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and all had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, proceeds to all uh, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I love it. I love hearing the sound of children in church. I, I, I mean that. Man, you guys, if there's anything... It's almost like I planned that. <laughs> if there is nothing that I want more and desire for our church, it's for us to do, to do life together. And when we have interruptions and we have children giggling and laughing and crying and kicking the seat backs behind us, by golly, we should absolutely praise God because we have children. 
with us. That we have children to even cry in our church means that we are reaching the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. I heard the song, The Blessing, as I was driving in this morning, and um, it's just it's, it's a reminder of the important role that we all have in, in, in raising up the next generation and so that they can influence their kids and their kids and their children and their children and their children, and we're all called to do it. We were, um, we were built for community. We were built to do life together. And um, even if you're one of those people who's like, I don't necessarily love people, God still wired us to be in relationship. You can be one who is more introspective and introverted and still be in fellowship and, and have a place at the table. You can be a person who is tattooed and earringed up and spiky haired and all the things like I was when I was a young 20 year old something or other who went back to church and you can have a place at the table. You can be struggling with any sin imaginable and we're gonna love you in that sin. We're gonna call you up and out of that sin and we're gonna call sin, sin because we're all sinners. If we didn't have uh, an ability to admit our sin, none of us would have a place at the table because we'd all be a bunch of hypocrites. We want all of you here to have a place. I don't care what you look like. I don't care what you've done, that we want you to be here at our table breaking bread with us just like the apostles were doing in the early church. The internet and social media, because this is my last sermon, I get a harp on that some more because you guys know my feelings on that. It has caused us the ability to be connected more than ever, but also more distant and separate than we've ever been before. Studies show that we are more connected than we've ever been, but we're more lonely and more isolated, and we feel more unknown to people than we've ever felt before. But how can that be? I had 3,000 friends on the Facebook. You all know I don't have any Facebook friends because I don't have the Facebook. But somewhere along the way, connectivity and community and togetherness has not fully clicked. We're connected, but we're not together. We have so much commonality, so much shared experiences that the algorithms online tell us exactly the people that we need to know and connect with, and yet even though we have all these shared things that we should be together on, we're not. We're separate. We're isolated because we become so laser-focused on what we think is uh, right, what we believe, that we, we aren't even willing to see people who are different than us. And as a church, we're called to be a group of people who are completely different. I think the idea of doing life together in, in Acts chapter 2 is Doing life together is an accurate statement, but it's deeper than that, right? This community of believers formed after the ascension of Jesus and the arrival of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost found themselves doing this new way of life, and yet here we are today trying to do things differently, trying to do instead of having life together, like the disciples in the book of Acts, breaking bread together and doing life. We're doing life different. We're eating at separate tables, and we're missing the point altogether, and so today we celebrate the graduates, right? An exciting time for our students where we get to celebrate the work that they've accomplished. As parents, we get to sit back and say, by golly, I can't believe they did it. And then we get to release them to the world. And, and, and high school is a transition. It's probably one of the most difficult when you go from high school to college. It's one of the most difficult transitions in a, in a person's life. But it's also a difficult transition in, in our students' faith. Research shows that, that teenagers are leaving the church at an alarming rate after graduation. You guys have heard the stats thrown around, and I know that 90% of statistics are made up 87% of the time, but here's what I found. 50% fall away from the church um, or from their faith after high school graduation, and some say that that number is upwards of 60 or 70%. I don't care if it's 50, 60, or 70%. Any number of students walking away from the church when they go to college is, is too many. And I think a lot of it has to do with two tables, that, that, that we have um, robust kids and youth programs, and, and we fail to find a place for kids and for students in the church. But I prepared this message, and then, then we come in this morning, and we're worshiping God, and I look up on platform, and I see... Isaac, who graduated last year on the drums. I see Abby playing the keys. I see um, Izzy Klaus up here singing, and I'm like, maybe, okay. Like, we're heading in a direction, and I love it, but let's not lose our momentum because we're doing, we're doing those things. We're, we're incorporating youth and children into worship, into serving. But for a lot of places, it's not happening 
because when these kids graduate, they don't have a place at the table. They've been so separated at their own table that, that they don't know necessarily what it's like to do church together. And this is why I love hearing children in church because they need to know that they are able to come and be here and do worship and hear the truth of the gospel. When kids graduate and they leave, they, they want to grow deeper in their faith. They want to experience a shared identity. But when they go and check out the adult table, they realize they don't have a place there. It's not time yet. You're not quite old enough. You're not quite ready. And so what do you do if you're told or you don't think you have a place at the table? You leave the meal and you go somewhere else or you don't go back at all. And so this is why teenagers are leaving the church and faith at alarming rates, because they don't have a place. And who suffers? Obviously the students, but we do as well. Because all of a sudden the church is missing something it needs. It needs the energy, the excitement, the the, the fussing and the crying and the kicking, and and, and the, the attitude that comes with having youth in church. We miss the gifts and the talents of young people. It's the passion and the willingness that young adults have to do things in the church. And at some point, we have to ask ourselves, are the two slash three tables working for us anymore? And I think the answer comes from the Gospel of Mark. So we're going to be in Mark chapter 10 now. So just go back a smidge. Mark chapter 10. We've got Jesus hanging out with his disciples. He's teaching them, and he is getting after them about some hot topics of the day. A, dare I say, adult conversation. Mark chapter 10. We're talking about divorce and marriage, verses 1 through 3. Jesus leaves Capernaum. He goes down to the region of Judea and into the area of the Jordan River. Once again, crowds are gathered around him, and as usual, he's teaching them. And a Pharisee comes up and tries to trap him with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife? Jesus answered with them with the question, what did Moses say in the law about divorce? I'm not talking about divorce today. But divorce is typically a more adult topic. And then he goes on a few few verses later. In verse 17, Jesus is walking on his way to Jerusalem, and a man comes running to him, kneels down, and says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Man, that's a great question. Jesus asks, Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone and honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all of these commands since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give your money to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come and follow me. And at this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And this amazed them. But Jesus said again, dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So we're talking about divorce. We're talking about money. We're talking about adultery. We're talking about murder. These are topics that one would say are more geared towards adults. But in the midst of all of this, people start bringing their children to Jesus. And the disciples see this, and Jesus gets upset. They start, the disciples are shooing away the children. This isn't their place. This is the adult table. We're talking about adult stuff. These kids shouldn't be here. What are they going to bring to the conversation? They're kids. They should go back to the kids' table where they belong. But Jesus stops it, and he gets a little angry, and he says, no, no, let the little children come to me. And the disciples are like, yeah, come on. You don't understand. Come on, Jesus. What do you, what do you know about having kids? I mean, they're loud. They're uh, kids. You don't understand. And Jesus says, no, you don't understand the kingdom of God, my kingdom that I came to reveal to you. The whole purpose that I exist is for these kids. It belongs to them just as much as it does belong to all y'all. Hashtag Jesus, paraphrase. They are essential, the children, to everything. And we, as parents... And the ones who sit at the adult table need to learn from the kids just as much as they need to learn from us. After this, Jesus leaves earth. He ascends to his Father in heaven. We've got Paul, right? Paul kind of takes over and starts going full speed ahead. He has this radical encounter with the risen Lord. He starts building and planting churches all over the place. And Paul writes to the importance of, of the unity that has, uh, that is required for the body to exist, right? So now we're in 1 Corinthians 12. 
Paul tells us that the church is like a body with many parts and that many parts make up the body. We've, you've heard this message before. We've preached on it before. We had a whole series on unity, but I think it's pertinent for our conversation today. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 20 through 25. So here's Paul. And he says this, as it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, these parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving great honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Kind of sounds like the church in Acts, where there was no division. No one was more important or less important because they were all a part of the church, the body of Christ. And we too need to have that same approach. I mean, uh, notice in this passage, as we look at it, the church is supposed to be diverse in race, right? We're supposed to have people from all nations here in church. In background, every single one of us has a unique testimony and a story. Some of us have the story of, uh, you know, I've known Jesus since I was knee-high to a grasshopper, and that's my testimony. Some people, they're like, I don't even know who this Jesus guy is, but for some reason I'm sitting in service on this Sunday morning. And that's what makes church unique. Every person has a unique story, a backstory, a testimony. And that's one of the best things is hearing testimonies. By golly, if you, man, we should, we should do that one day. I'm just saying this because I can. Wouldn't it be cool just to have a day where we all sit around and talk about how the Lord just absolutely radically just jumped into our lives and that no matter how much we try to do life on our own, we realize our desperate need for him. And everybody's got a different story. It could be drugs, could be alcohol, could be just like parents who were like dedicated to pouring into their children. But all of us have a story because here we are all today. Wouldn't it be fun to sit around and talk about our stories? Anyways, we all have unique abilities and giftings, right? Some of us are apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. Some of us are gifted with uh, discernment. Some of our, us are prayer warriors. Not everyone is gifted to, to, to preach, and that's okay because collectively, together, we round each other out, right? Because Steve can do things on the guitar that I couldn't do if he paid me a million dollars, Right? Brian can do amazing things in the kitchen. I can sometimes cook an egg, right? Pastor Bruce, I don't even know where to begin with you, man. Bruce has a shepherd's heart, and he loves people well. In spite of the stupid things they've done, he loved me well. He loves me well. We all together are better because of our unique talents and gifts. And without them, we, would, we wouldn't function. And in passions, like it's, it's okay that some of us are super, super excited about, hey, why don't every week, church, why don't we do testimonies every week? Why don't we do hymns every week? It's okay to have passions, the things that you're like, yeah, this is the thing that I want to, this is my thing. And as a church, we need to say, yes, you, that's your thing, then let's, you do it here. Let's come here. Here are the things that you need to do your thing, and we're going to do all we can to support you. Because not everybody's going to have that same passion. And together, collectively, if we can do the things as a church that all of us are uniquely passionate about, man, cool things can happen. So we're different, and that's okay. But what happens when that body part is missing? Like I said, if we don't have Brian's ability to, to mobilize men in the kitchen, men's breakfast is going to be like donut holes, which is okay because we're guys. But I would rather have some sort of like eggs benedict that Brian whips up than, than donut holes or breakfast pizza because we're like, oh, I got a thing in five minutes, what do we do, right? Can the church survive? Yeah, but are we running at full function? Can we accomplish things that are good? Sure, but, but do we thrive when we don't utilize each person's gifts and talents? Not likely. So then Paul describes this conflict. He says, because there's different parts of the church and we are all different, we clearly explain that, that sometimes we might look at another part and say, we don't need you. We don't really need that, that ministry, that thing, that, that, that gifting. And yet, it causes conflict. I mean, oftentimes I see it play out between age demographics. Parents with young kids say, we need this. Parents who, who have grown children say, well, we don't really need that. We need this. And the truth is, it's kind of like saying to the body, well, I don't really need feet, but I need my hands. I don't need my gallbladder, but I really need my appendix. 
I'm not sure what either of those do, but I'm pretty sure they're important. I know you can take out your appendix, but I'm pretty sure that God designed us to have all of the parts. It's like saying a baseball team doesn't need a pitcher because the pitcher doesn't hit well. Or a soccer team doesn't need a goalie because they don't score. Or a football team. By the way, I just learned this the other day. Did you know that a kicker and a punter are different? Yeah, I didn't know that. So I, here I am asking Brian Buscini upstairs, like, hey, man, what? I introduced you as the kicker, and you, you're the punter? I don't know these things. And everyone in the room was like, anyways, it's like a football team not needing a kicker because, technically speaking, they don't do a lot of patch, uh, throwing and catching and tackling. They, they kick the ball on the goal if they're the punter, no, if they're the kicker, or they just kick off the ball if they're the punter. See, I learned things at church. It's like saying that a cake doesn't need eggs because they're kind of funny looking. It's like saying that Mexican food doesn't need spice because maybe your little brother doesn't like it, right? Teams need all positions to be filled. Meals need all of the ingredients, and we need every single unique person that's here at church. Just because uh, a little old lady can't play dodgeball like some of the youth group kids doesn't mean that we don't need her in our community. And you're not important just because you can't preach like Pastor Jeff, right? Because we're all gifted and unique in different ways. All of us are significant in the unique and individual things that we bring to the table. And students, I'm telling you the same thing so that you know that you have a unique and special gifting that God has equipped you to do in wherever you go, in whatever church you end up at. In the medical community, there's this thing um, called a phantom limb. When you have a, a limb that is, that is amputated, 80% of people still feel like that limb is attached. And in a similar way, it is, it is a significant loss for the individual because even though that limb is missing, they feel like something is amiss. The absence causes pain. It's like, it's like when you get hurt, right? You ever sprain your ankle? Like the whole body suffers because now you're, you're walking on the broke ankle and all of a sudden you got back pain, issues, neck, right? And you get a little bee sting on your leg and it's this tiny little hole in your body, but your whole body is hurting because you got this tiny little bee sting. And the, and the church is the same way when we lose people, right? Everyone should be affected when somebody leaves our church. Because that person is not fulfilling the role that God has called them to in our church. It's like the church has phantom limb pain. So my question to you guys, students, parents, grandparents, mothers, is that do, pause, are you fulfilling your role in the body of Christ? Are you doing what God has called you to or are you a phantom limb do you see your role in the body of the church as God sees it? Like, what can you do to get involved in the church? Serve in children's ministry? Serve on, on a leadership team? Maybe consider becoming or going through the process of training up to become an elder or a deacon? Can you serve in our, uh, first, uh, our first impressions and become an, an usher? Can you help Haley do sweet website posty stuff? Can you clean the youth pastor's office? box things up. Paul ends 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you, you, you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. I believe the Greek for you means y'all. All y'all, all of you are a part of the body of Christ. And that's why for the church to thrive, everybody needs a place at the table. When, when the two tables come together, you got the kids table and the adult table at family gatherings, each one, as I said, is missing out on something until that crazy uncle, you know, that guy who's like, I don't know why we got two tables. Let's put everybody together and then make everybody up. And then amazing things happen because not only does he pull the tables together, but he makes everybody stand up and, and then everybody gets the best of both worlds. The kids get to hear the adults. The adults get to hear the kids. And that's what happens on Sunday morning when we got everybody here. We're at one table and you get to hear the kids screaming and yelling. You get to hear the crazy youth pastor doing his thing. You get to hear and watch the people up front nodding off because they're tired because it was a long weekend, right? Graduation, anybody? Um, because the crazy uncle gets it. He understands that for the family to thrive, everybody needs to do life together and have a place at the table. For the church to thrive, we need to have a place. And the same thing happens in the church. What does it look like at church then when we pull the tables together? It looks like kids bringing in their laughter and their fun and their crying into worship. It looks like teenagers and young adults serving together, doing things. I think about uh, these couple of mission trips that have happened recently for the missions team. We've had students going with adults, and it's been this, like, this intergenerational mixture of kids and adults doing ministry together, serving. And I think it is a beautiful picture of what God has called us to. It looks like teenagers and young adults having a legitimate and heard voice in our church. That means at the business meeting next week, 
even if a student isn't a member because they're not old enough, and they have a question about things, that they raise their hand and say, I got a question. Help me understand this. And then we look and we go, yes. Like, let me hear what you say. Because they should have a voice because they are not going to be the church, but they are the church right now. Where else will kids learn about the 43-year history of our church? Our heritage, our shared identity, where we came from. That we hear stories from the saints of our church who, who, who remember what it was like when we were just a dozen people gathered together in a random building trying to do church a little bit differently. Like, we need to hear those stories passed on. But if we're not pulling the tables together, we're going to miss out. The other end of the generation needs to hear the stories of the kids about how God's at work in their life and the things that he is doing. And after the meal, where does everybody go? The kids go back to the backyard to play. The teens go back to throwing a baseball around. And sometimes a crazy uncle bridges the gap between old and young. We need more crazy uncles in church. We need people who are brave and willing to volunteer in children's ministry, in kids' ministry. This summer, there's going to be opportunities to serve that um, might be coming up. The church might be asking for help. And and my my challenge to you guys is be a crazy aunt or uncle. But before we do that, real quick, um, I would love, if you've served, it's a generic statement, in kids, in, in youth, So anything from birth to 12 in this church at any time, can you stand up? I want to see what kind of crazy uncles we've got right now. Yes. Look at all you crazy uncles. Let's clap. Thank you. Um, We can't do it without you guys. And it is really, really hard. Um to do what you guys do. Because you guys give of your time, you guys give of your Sunday mornings, you guys give of your Wednesday nights, you guys go on week-long trips with students and you have to worry about sleeping in a hotel room with seven kids. It stinks, it smells, maybe not in the girls' rooms, but the boys' rooms does. <laughs> and, and yet, you guys take time away from work to do and to serve for VBS. And some of us are, are blessed enough to get paid to do it. And so we need more people like you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. It's important to meet people where they're at, but it's important when we eat together at one table. Imagine teens growing up knowing they had a place in the church because all along their life, they've played a role in the church. I look at the worship team kids, and they've been a part of worship for a long time in our church. I've seen littles up here doing the, the bell ringing thing that, that, um, that Rebecca has them do. But, but what else can we do to get our kids actively involved in the church? What would happen if kids and teenagers stopped hearing that they're the future of the church and started hearing that they're the church now, and because they're part of the church now, they can play an important and integral role of the body of the church today. Imagine what would happen if we had more crazy aunts and uncles who, who would, would willingly serve and volunteer their time, learn with the kids, teach them, and let's be honest, to grow with them because I've learned more from the kids that I've ministered to than they've probably learned from me. Um, we would be a church that doesn't just exist, that we would be a church that would not just function, but we would be a church that thrives. And because for the church to thrive, everybody needs a place at the table where everybody has a place, everybody has a role to play. And very much like the Church of Acts, there will be a crazy, huge kingdom impact, greater than we could have ever imagined. But for that to happen, the church needs to have a place at the table for everybody. Lord, we thank you. Um, Thank you for the church. Thank you for your... (laughs) The family that we call this body of believers, we all, Lord, have different parts. We all have different giftings and talents and abilities and skills. But, Lord, I just pray. I pray for our church, Lord. I pray for the next generation. I pray for for our kids' kids and their children's children that you would just raise up leaders in this church 
that you would raise up student leaders, that you would raise up leaders who are fourth graders, who are pouring into the younger generation. Lord, thank you for your love that you showed for us on the cross. If there's someone here who doesn't know you, Lord, I just pray that you would break down their heart, that they would cry out and recognize that they're sinners, that they're separated from you, that they need you in their life, that, that trying to do things on their own doesn't work, and that there is a place at the table for them in spite of whatever's going on in their life, that there is a place and that you want to meet them and you want to be with them and you want to fellowship with them and that all because of what you did for them on the cross, willingly laying down your life that they could be set free from the penalty of sin and whatever trial and struggle that they're going through, that this would be the thing that they would say, I can't do it alone from you, God, I need you. I pray for these students that are getting ready to get sent off, Lord, that you would just help them find a place. Lord, I pray for... um, the offering that the ushers are about to receive as they come forward. Lord, I pray that it would be just another extension of us worshiping you, that collectively we get to worship and praise you with our tithes, with our offerings, knowing, Lord, that as the church receives them, that we would, we, you would multiply them, we would use them for your benefit, that we would build bigger tables so we can have people coming together. May you get the glory for everything that you've done and everything that you are doing in this church. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.